Hello, I'm Bryony Worthington, and this is Cleaning Up. This week's episode, in a break from tradition, features two guests as we explore the topic of methane emissions and how to find and prevent them. My first guest is Sebastian Briol from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in California. Sebastian is an expert in using a range of technologies to trace greenhouse gas emissions. He oversees scientific detection projects across the USA. I wanted to ask him whether he thinks we have the right technology and regulatory frameworks in place to speed progress. And my second guest, Sharon Wilson, approaches the topic from the perspective of a local citizen impacted by the fracking boom in the Permian Basin in Texas. She set up and runs the NGO Oilfield Witness and is a certified methane hunter, using handheld devices to uncover gas leaks, making them visible to a wider audience. Both guests bring many years of expertise to bear on this topic of methane hunting, which recently has seen a flurry of interest thanks to the successful launch of MethaneSat, the first civil society-funded effort to find methane super emitters from space. I hope you enjoy this episode. I think we're going to need a range of approaches to crack this problem. And while Sebastian and Sharon may have different styles, they both agree that more visibility is key to driving the urgent action that's now needed. Please join me in welcoming first Sebastian and then Sharon to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps others find us. Follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram or LinkedIn to participate in the discussion and make sure that you sign up for the Cleaning Up newsletter on Substack. It contains alerts about upcoming episodes and thoughts from Bryony and me on the issues covered. You'll find it at cleaninguppod.substack.com. That's cleaninguppod or one word, dot substack dot com. Finally, visit our archive of over 150 conversations with the world's climate leaders at cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, as well as by the Liebreich Foundation, the Gilardini Foundation, and our newest supporter, Ecopragma Capital. Sebastian, thank you so much for joining me on Cleaning Up. Um, I'm sorry we're not in person, even though we are in the same part of the world. But I wanted to just um, begin by asking you to introduce yourself in your own words and say a bit about what you do. Hello, Brianni. Yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, to talk to you today. It's been a while, um, but um, hopefully we'll do this in person soon. So my name is Sebastian B. Rhodes. Uh, you notice a slight accent, right? I'm going to say a slight, but probably not as light as I'd like to, it to be. I'm a geophysicist uh, by training. Um, I have a master in fundamental physics and a PhD in remote sensing, uh, where I developed a method to use uh, tracers to estimate greenhouse gases uh, in Europe when I was doing my PhD in Europe. Uh, I am a staff scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is one of the 17 national laboratory in the US, where I lead the climate science departments and a few projects. My work is mostly on greenhouse gases uh, emission estimates and understanding carbon cycle. So I lead the project for the California Energy Commission uh, called uh, Summation, uh, which looks at uh, methane emission from the oil and gas sector in the southern San Joaquin Valley. I also lead the uh, Department of Energy Atmospheric Radiation Carbon Measurement Program, where we look at greenhouse gases uh, emissions and um, doing a lot of measurements all over the US. And then I also co-lead the Ameriflux Management Project, which is a network uh, of more than 600 PI managed sites, where we measure the exchange of carbon water energy between the land surface, which could be vegetation, uh, trees, crops, um, water bodies, uh, in North, Central, and South America. I was uh, born when global average atmospheric emission ratio was around 325 ppm. I joined the lab when it was 369 ppm, and now it's almost at 422 ppm. So that gives you an idea of what my carbon dioxide age is, if you can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, and, and that is the metric that matters, right? That, that part's per million as measured by the Keeling curve. Uh, Mauna Loa is is the thing that you know keeps us all up at night, right? Uh, 
worrying about uh, the effect of that concentration rising. But um, let's talk a little bit about methane, um, because I know that's something you've worked on. But globally, methane is a little bit still of a, of a puzzle, right? So yeah, methane is the second anthropogenic greenhouse gases after carbon dioxide, right? Um, the, the challenge with methane is it has a warming potential 28 times higher than carbon dioxide on a 100 year time horizon. And since uh, 1750, the atmospheric methane concentration has more than doubled due to human activities. So after, you know, what we've seen uh, using global uh, atmospheric measurements, we've seen that after a period of stabilization in the early 2000s, methane concentration has started to rise again after 2007, with no slowing any uh, slowing down of those uh, accumulation rates. Uh, I mean, and we know that uh, the increase of methane concentration right now follows trends of future scenarios, which is which are not in line with the objective of the Paris Agreement to keep at most, uh, global temperature below 1.5 degrees. So we need to tackle uh, also methane emission. I'd like to make the parallel between, so we need to tackle both, right, CO2 and methane. But I see because of the short, um, shorter life uh, time of methane, we have ways to act really quickly and see uh, impacts rapidly. It's like running a marathon and a sprint, right? I think we still need to do the marathon at some point for CO2. It's going to take some time. Uh, but we now have to run the sprint for methane and tackle reduced methane emissions. And so methane emissions, um, human activity contribute to about 60% of the total methane emissions. Uh, and natural sources are also you know, multiple and diverse and not as well quantified as the others, you know, from lake reservoirs, termites, and so on. Emissions from the uh, agriculture and waste activity contribute about 60% of those um, human activities. Uh, you know, it's uh, entering fermentation from cars and manual management, uh, uh, oil and gas uh, production and use, uh, you know, handling of solid and liquid waste, uh, coal extraction, rice cultivation, and so on. So there, there are clear pathways on how we could reduce those uh, methane emission from those human activities. Uh, we just need to have, you know, uh, a good way to implement. And but does all do all of those um, that you so see? You talked about the trends in methane rising after plateauing, and I seem to remember reading that there is still a little bit of question mark as to what's causing that uh, steep rise. Uh, at a global level, is that correct? Yeah, there's still a little bit of uncertainty between uh, where is the change happening, right? It, it seems to be clear that uh, oil and gas industry, for instance, in the US, doesn't explain completely that change. You know, we've seen an increase of fracking, an increase of natural gas uh, emissions but um, and production, but that trend doesn't explain the amplitude of the change that we are seeing. So there might be some, um, there, there are probably some Phenomena in the in the tropics that we don't have a good handle on, and because it's hard to do measurements uh, in the tropics, for instance, and we don't have um, you know yet good satellite coverage, uh, so mm. um, there's still a little bit of a puzzle. So we know it's rising. We do not yet fully understand why, and uh, there's also observation that we it's hard to get like from other countries, like for so. yeah. And before we get on to more local subjects, just pausing there at the global level, um, you and I have both been involved in conversations where we've talked about the need to invest in, in, in sort of more, more infrastructure to enable us to solve some of these puzzles. So um, you mentioned that it might be in the tropics. I guess there's possible changes happening within forests at a large scale due to temperature changes or changes in precipitation. And maybe we don't have the right measurement equipment to really help us solve that or what about the the, the the polar extremes where temperatures are rising at three times the global average or even more and are we worried about changes there in terms of methane as well so i do believe we have the tools uh to really uh better understand it just uh, it requires a little bit of investment uh from either from different stakeholders right it could be federal agencies state agencies foundations uh, philanthropy and so on. I mean, we've, we've talked about all those. Uh, it's clear that we have a good handle on the framework on how to do this. It's just the implementation. So for instance, today, 
and I, I wanted to check the news today. It's Mar uh, on March 1st, there was to methane site, which is uh, a, a private public partnership, you know, between EDF and uh, philanthropy and uh, University of Harvard was going to launch. And I, I, I was going to check before we talked, but I don't know if it launched or not. But uh, it's been delayed from March 1st to today, and I don't know if it launched today. So, uh, but I need to check. But there's a lot of efforts uh, across the board to get more handled on the uh, uh, measurement side of, of greenhouse gases, because as you um, know, there's some discrepancy between bottom-up and top-down approach, right? When we bottom-up is we try to get a number of uh, what the emission profile looks like using um, economic statistics and um, uh, emission factors and so on, while uh, the top-down is really observation-driven, uh, and you cannot buy with observation, right? So, uh, but they're, they're costly and more, they're more costly and, and more difficult to maintain and, and uh, implement. Yeah. So I was I was at Environmental Defense Fund when uh, they started talking about raising money from philanthropy to put a satellite in the air. And it was very exciting times because then the cost of the equipment had come down and the cost of space, uh, putting things into space had come down to such a point where it was conceivable that philanthropy and civil society could launch its own detection uh, um, satellite. And yeah, I will, will, by the time this airs, we will know, we'll put in the show notes uh, whether the satellite's in the air or successfully or not. But but that's, that is an example where, um, you know, mem perhaps member states' budgets are being squeezed or international budgets and science budgets might not be as available, but philanthropy has a role to play there in perhaps filling the gap. Absolutely. And, and there's another satellite. Uh, so I... I don't know if you remember uh, Jerry Brown in California, uh, you know, when he gave a talk at AGU like a few years ago in 2016 and said, yes, California, we launched its satellites. And actually, indeed, uh, in a partnership between the uh, California Air Resource Board uh, in California and the um, um, uh, Carbon Mapper, uh, are slated to launch another satellite dedicated to methane measurements uh, in, in the fall of this year. So that's another example of great partnership to give us some uh, additional constraint on our budget for methane, for instance. Mm. But this, so, but let's go back to more what you do then, because uh, whilst you're across the the combination of satellites and the, the more ground based uh, measurements, you're looking after uh, what I call tall towers or, or flux towers that are that are capturing on the ground kind of quite large scale measurements, aren't you? Do you want to just talk a bit about that then the net the network that you look after? So. Um... There are a lot of instrumentation that we can use to uh, do measurements for different purposes. One of the purposes we want to address is really understanding uh, greenhouse gases emissions at the more either regional, state, regional, or local scale. And a way to do this is to use uh, tall towers that have sensing um, upstream conditions from the towers using uh, different um, technologies, right? It could be and with a range of cost and effort and ease of use and uh, detection limits and so on. So that we all use. So what we've done is uh, for the Department of Energy um, um, Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Carbon Program, we've had developed a framework to do this uh, in the Eastern North Atlantic um, uh, in the 2015. And then we did also in, at the same time, we did this in the North Slope of Alaska. So two regions were very important the Eastern North Atlantic is because uh, it's a, it was a really great background site for Europe, for instance, because, you know, well, the way we do uh, emission estimates using atmospheric inversion is we want to look at, you know, a continent as a box and we want to know what's coming in the box and out of the box and using more ma difficult mathematical, mathematical uh, uh, models. Basically, we, you know, we use the difference between the two and atmospheric transport and uh, dispersion uh, of uh, those chemicals to assess what the land surface is emitting, basically, or absorbing, right? And so those sites in the eastern North Atlantic were really important for this. In the north slope of Alaska, as you described, it's one of the regions that has seen the fastest increase in temperature, um, all the Arctic band. And so we wanted to have a constraint of emission, local emissions, uh, both from, because north slope of Alaska is also a oil and gas industry uh, heavy, um, but also destabilization of the permafrost, 
uh, which you know makes uh, carbon available to microbial community, which could have, depending on the surface condition, wet or dry, could lead to increase of methane or CO2 emissions. So we wanted to monitor all this in, in those regions. And then we have a site in the uh, south central of the US um, in Oklahoma, which has been key to actually show that the uh, US EPA estimates of methane emissions have been severely underestimated for years. And we're helping, you know, getting that budget under control. Uh, so. mm. And you've also, um, bringing it back to our state of California, uh, you've also been looking at oil and gas methane emissions, right? Ba Bakersfield, uh, I've, I've been exploring the state and you, all roads lead to Bakersfield, essentially, if you're heading south. And um, it, But it's a, it's a huge area of oil and gas exploration, quite an old field. And so do you want to mention a bit more about what you were doing there? Yeah, so that's part of a project uh, submission um, where we basically want to develop a framework for California when we throw everything we can at the problem to try to optimize the cost and usability for different uh, conditions, right? So we have, uh, so I'm going to go from the ground up. We have uh, people walking uh, around trying to sense uh, methane emission from the distribution network of natural gas in the city of Bakersfield. We do mobile uh, vehicle survey where we drive around uh, either uh, the oil field or in cities to really find larger uh, leaks. We use um, aircraft uh, observation to really try to get um, an understanding of um, Bakersfield metropolitan area emission, but also uh, oil and gas fields uh, in, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, which are the largest uh, producing region in California. And then um, different type of remote sensing uh, leading to you know, usability of uh, remote sensing satellite-based uh, estimates uh, that we're seeing coming in the next few years. So this project has been very, very interesting because it brings together different scale, but also different communities, right? Because we we see that uh, where we have the largest uh, methane emissions area are often where disadvantaged communities live also. And so we're working also with uh, um, different outreach group like the Central California's My Collaborative to really um, let people know in those communities what we are doing and what we are finding. Anyway. Mm. And and I mean, my interest in this is always comes back to well, once we've found that there's a source, uh, what can we do about it, and what do our policymakers and our regulators need to do about it? And the particular challenge with older oil and gas fields, I guess, is that you know you've got bigger firms moving out and maybe leaving behind smaller firms or uh, or you have orphan wells i mean it, you know if you had a magic wand uh, what what do we need to be doing with uh, these older fields do you think well, that's very interesting um there's another project that i uh lead here in uh, at the berkeley lab that's called the catalog program uh where we're looking at undocumented orphan wells that have been abandoned once their production um, so very applied project, right? Uh, we have the, once the production doesn't is not sustainable for you know uh, to make money basically for all producers, uh, some companies abandon their wells. You know they file for bankruptcy, they, and then the states gets the the well back, the lease back, and it's up to the state to plug it. Um, production started really really early in California, and so a lot of documentation has been lost. Some of those wells we don't even know where they are, and they're still leaking. Uh, either methane on the surface or contamination of the groundwater and so on. So you can imagine it's a pretty tall order at the scale of the U.S. Um, we think about 2 million wells fall into that category. And what we've been doing is uh, trying to find um, assess state-of-the-art technology, but also find low-cost technology to really scale um, this effort to find and uh, so find the wells, detect methane emissions, and quantify those emissions in order to prioritize those wells for plugging and abandonment. It's a huge uh, tall order, but uh, it's very exciting because we are, we are, you know, we are making an impact on, on this. Um, where should be our um, strongest efforts? Those are usually not the largest leakage point that we find, but there's a lot of small sources, right? So, uh, although there was a study published uh, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, a group in Colorado really um, led that uh, paper where he found 
uh, undocumented often well, leaking up to 80 kilograms per hour, which is massive. Uh, and so if you look at the distribution of emissions across the uh, the wells, either producing or non-producing, you see that there's a strong bias towards uh, super emitters, wells that are emitting more than 30 kilograms per hour. That means that if we cater our efforts towards those uh, super emitters well, we can find and we can work with operators or state agency to plug them, we, we go a long way. Right? So. Mm -hmm. And, and are the regulations sufficient in California, would you say? Have you got the right powers, the right, um, you know, is it a question of just enforcement or do you actually need new laws? Oh, that's a tricky question. So um, I do believe we need to work with the operators. So this is a science project. Um, I don't worry about the regulation because that's not my goal. My goal is really to understand the profile of uh, methane emissions and really work with operators. We've developed very good partnership with, um, for instance, the California Research Corporation, who operates one of the largest oil and gas fields in California, the El Kills near Baker Field. And they've been absolutely responsive to engagement, positive engagement, right? So I think um, my approach has been really bring all the stakeholders on board, have open, honest conversation, and try to fix the problem. Uh, I, I'm not at all into um, uh, refusing to talk to all the stakeholders. I think it's very, very important that we all, we're all part of the solution, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I suppose some people might question, though, that, you know, this is a sector that's made a huge amount of money over the years. And um, the, the true cost of that production hasn't really been paid by those companies, right? Not, not least the greenhouse gases, but also now this cleanup job. That, as you say, it's too easy to just declare bankruptcy and then let the state deal with it. And so it's kind of, I, I totally hear you about the stakeholders and trying to find a, a sort of mediated solution. But ultimately, this is about economics, isn't it? It, it is absolutely about economics. So there's, there are ideas right now. So it's hard to reinvent what was done in the past, right, to change the world as we go. I think... Um, there's a new model that should be put in place for when you allow companies to have new lease, for instance, or new that should factor in the cost of plugging and abandonment of those wells, which is not the case right now. So upfront, this should be put in into the way you uh, you factor the cost of your production, uh, and I think that would be really, really a long way. Mm. Yeah. And as you say, well, it's interesting, you, you can't go back and change history. But uh, what I do see about America is that they're quite, they quite like law courts and litigation uh, to solve problems. And in a way, you know, a civil society case could be made that this was negligence or that this was reckless or that this should have been dealt with at the time. And I, I don't know, perhaps there is a way of going back through time and holding people at account. I mean, it, it I suppose it depends on yeah, your, your perspectives, but it does feel like this, at, at more and more attention at least, is being paid to this problem, right? Would you say I, that's... I think so. I think it's true. Um, my main concern is um, if you really want to have a positive impact on the ground, you need to have all the stakeholders in the room and have honest conversations. If we start demonizing them, conversation is over and that's it. And as you said, I mean, litigation is a huge fun job in the US and people love to litigate and um, um, so but it, it, it just to put, to put the other side there when EDF announced that they were going to put up a satellite it was surprising how much easier it was to get oil and gas companies to pick up the phone you know like the there's sort of a dance isn't there between uh, you have to have some stick I think or at least some uh, plausible uh, policy response that's yeah, going to tighten rather than a yeah. Stick. What I'd really love to see, and that's just a suggestion, is, uh, and it needs to be done through um, uh, probably the feds or the states. Why don't we create a green label? Because that says this, whatever oil, gas was produced with, you know, uh, minimum impact to the environment. I mean, I don't know how we assess this, but because. Again, there's a lot of players, and the U.S. is very unique in the world, right? Most 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 producing countries have one state companies or one company you have to deal with. 
in the U.S. is thousands and thousands and thousands, like family owns 20 wells, uh, and they have been doing business for 150 years. Uh, there are a few majors, but it's really a different scale of the problem, and, and the complexity is very different. And so we have to also understand this. I would love to see, as I said, a green label that says this was, uh, you know, like you can quantify the maintenance costs that people are doing, the uh, um, emission estimate that they have ever, and have this being the good player, reward the good players, right? Because most often what I'm seeing is a few bad players give a really bad rep. Mm. I don't know. So I'm a I'm a little bit skeptical because it's such a fungible commodity, right? That that the consumer, you know, get the, all these barrels. They all end up in refineries and come out as products. And it, you know, I I'm I think labeling might be too softer. I, I, I hear you though that if it is about just a small fragment of bad actors, I, I would have thought a lot more transparency and a lot more mm. instruments like the ones you've described that you're using or even citizen science uh initiatives to try and make this more visible that that kind of uh visibility because it, the best label is only as good as the amount of uh scrutiny you put onto the the data that goes into the label right and and if they're not accounting for it correctly how do you know yeah absolutely absolutely no i it's, yeah. it's a complicated problem uh I mean, as you can tell probably i'm working on eggshells right i mean it's a very thin line and um yeah, it's it's very complicated. Uh, yeah, think. yeah. Uh, so when it comes to your work in California, you're working closely with the the oil and gas companies and the regulators to try and find you know sources that can be fixed quickly, right? Because that's what we all want less less methane emissions in the atmosphere. Um, is it is this common, or how are other states uh, in America? How do they compare to what's going on in California? So um, yeah, as we all read in the in the news, I mean, the state of California is. Uh, I don't know if I say it, um, mo wants to move away from oil and use of oil and gas uh, uh, in the state of California, um, which is very different from what I've seen in other states uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, so in California, the state is pretty, um, I don't want to, maybe I could say hostile to oil and gas uh, in general, but uh, I do believe companies are trying their best uh, in California, the company I work with, uh, to really you know, comply and find the leaks and addressing the problem. Um, I do work also in other states, uh, for instance, uh, in Texas, um, where the oil and gas industry is regulated by the Railroad Commission, uh, which is an interesting historic uh, precedent and tells you a little bit, you know, um, how much uh, oil and gas industry is being regulated in, in Texas. But clearly, oil and gas companies um, have, in Texas have more leniency uh, and legislation applies in a different fashion that, than in California, right? And we see this across the nation. Uh, for different mm -hmm. basin, different agencies are responsible for, for enforcing, uh, um, you know, methane emissions. So the feds yeah. are trying to, you know, uh, uh, EPA has put new regulation in place, new laws in place, but we'll see how it's, um, it applies to individual states. So that's, so, and I mean, even taking it beyond, so if we, if we think there's quite a high degree of variance within the U United States, you can imagine what it's like then at a global level. I mean, the, the variance and the leniency must be so different. Well, so, so, so look, at, I was talking about superior emitters in California, right? So in California, what we assume superior emitters is about, um, you know, 30 kilograms per hour. It's very arbitrary, there's no rule, but roughly that's what it is, and it helps guide us on the technology we want to use, usefulness of remote sensing technologies and so on, and what we do on the ground. There was a paper a couple of years ago uh, by a French group uh, that was looking at ultra emitters, not super emitters, ultra emitters. Ultra emitters are people that are emitting 2.5 ton of methane per hour. So the scale is a little bit different, and there's a few of them in the world where, um, you, yeah, I mean, it's, remote sensing is a great way to get to it because, um, yeah, in, Ka in Kazakhstan, for instance, in some part of Russia, where there's no enforce, enforcing mechanism, and it's it's a different mm -hmm. approach uh, to this. So yeah, and that and that's where satellites really can come into their absolutely. own, right, for those ultra emitters, because, uh, and and ult and ultimately. Maybe we do then get to a point like we did with the ozone or with the atomic test ban, where 
there is a kind of global enforcement because you know as the impacts of climate change get ever more you know urgent and apparent i feel like we need to go up a gear uh in terms of our urgency and our, our the seriousness with which we treat this absolutely i think enforcement is going to be difficult uh unless there's um multilateral agreements uh uh, on um, limiting not only global temperature, but also emissions. Uh, it's a complex problem. Uh, but I think, yes, um, we have good partners uh, on the international communities to do this, but not all the partners are playing equally, contributing equally to that uh, goal that we're trying to achieve. So remote sensing is a good way to do this because you don't need to request access of anything and you can tackle you know those big super emitters that really, really, are the low-hanging fruits for us to, to fix. I mean, it's, it's, those are no brainer. We should go fix them or find a way to fix them. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Sebastian. Uh, fantastic talking to you. And I look forward to seeing you in person before too long. Thank you, Brianne. Thank you. Sharon, it's uh, really great uh, to be speaking to you today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, do you think you could start us off just by uh, introducing yourself in your own words and telling us what you do? I'm Sharon Wilson, and I'm director of Oilfield Witness, an environmental nonprofit, and I'm a methane hunter. So I've since 2014, I have been using an optical gas imaging camera. It's an instrument with an onboard camera that makes visible the normally invisible pollution from oil and gas facilities. And can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you became a methane hunter? I mean, it's not a job you can apply for. So uh, how, how did you get to this point? It's not a job I ever wanted um, it's an, or ever thought about, but I moved in 1996 I moved out to Wise, W-I-S-E, Wise County, Texas, and I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know this, that George Mitchell was experimenting, learning how to marry the two technologies, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, to produce oil and gas from shale. And he did that all around me. The first well that produced oil and gas from shale was drilled in 1997 and I moved there in 1996. So I saw it happening in real time and was right there on the front line. My air turned brown, my water turned black. And that made me really mad because I had this idyllic, beautiful place in the country where my kids could run around free and I could have horses and you know, grow a garden. And then the next thing I know, I'm watering my garden with who knows what's in my water and the air is foul. And so I had a crash course in the fracking boom and I was right there on the very ringside seat to the circus that is fracking impacts. And so That's how I got interested in what was happening. And I learned about this technology. And in 2014, I became the first just regular person, not governmental, not industry person to get certified an optical gas imaging thermographer certification. And so having done that, like kind of, Talk to us a little bit then about, you know, what were you doing before you became a kind of uh, campaign or a citizen scientist, I guess, in this in this in this field? I was a mom, um, you know, going going to work every day, taking my kid to um, baseball practice. And I would see all of these horrible things on the side of the road. At first, I just saw these towers of lights and they were encroaching on our land, um, creating a situation where we could no longer enjoy the stars at night, which was one of our big forms of enjoyment. Um, I drove to one of these towers during the daytime, and what I saw was just, I couldn't even process it because there was black slimy liquid shooting out in a pit 
and dug in the ground and diesel, thick, thick black diesel fumes everywhere. It was very loud. It smelled horrible. And I watched the process from drilling to uh, fracking, which was also extremely loud. And, you know, big clouds of this frac sand, which is silica, which is very harmful if you breathe it. Um, huge clouds of that, big, lots of diesel. Um, and then after that, they did the flow back, which was the worst part, because that's when all the chemicals they put down hole mix with the hydrocarbons and heavy metals and everything, and they come back up the hole to the surface. And they just, they put it, they put the flow back in these tanks that have a 14 by 14 open vent on the top. So it just vents out to the open air. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole process from there, they uh, start producing, they put the liquids in tanks, but it's mixed with gas. So the gas rises to the surface, creates pressure, and that pressure has to be released. So they actually have on the tanks pressure relief valves. Um, but then eventually they developed vapor recovery systems that's, that are supposed to take care of that. But we find those failing about 75% of the time. And even the vapor recovery systems have to have pressure relief valves. So, you know, this is, it's physics. It's a physics problem where the gas is volatile. It expands and you know, it's inside steel and the mm. steel is not gonna, going to expand. So. so this is all, this you've learned this really, haven't you? So having gone from being, a, you know, a concerned individual upset about your local environment, how, is it true to say that then the methane problem was kind of the second thing you, you got involved in and realizing that that was also not just locally damaging, but globally damaging because it's such a powerful greenhouse gas. And, and so is that the journey you went on from local to worrying more about the global? Right. I was I was at first I was very concerned about the water because I had a well, a water well. Mm -hmm. And then I was concerned because I realized how much fresh water they were pulling out of the aquifers and then uh, using that water and permanently removing it when they inject it in the disposal well, it's permanently removed from our active hydrologic cycle. And that's a pretty, I mean, that's a lot of hubris. I can't, I can't, it's very hard to grasp, you know, the amount of hubris it takes to take clean water and turn it into trash and then throw it away. Hmm. But so that was my first concern. And then I was concerned about, the emissions because it's volatile organic compounds and people were complaining, people were getting sick. And then in about 2011, it was before then that I tuned into the uh, climate impacts. But in 2011, when uh, Bob, How uh, Robert Howarth and Tony Ingrafia released their study showing that the impacts of shale gas were worse on the climate than coal. Um, that's when I really realized that it's not about a local issue. It's a global issue. Mm. And so when did you set up your, your, your charity? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, Oilfield Witness is just about, it's less than a year old because I was working for a big nonprofit earthworks for 13 years but now I'm working for um, Oilfield Witness, where um, I don't have to follow talking points. <laughs> I don't have to worry about um, telling the truth. Mm. And so this has given you a platform. And so, so now, I mean, tell us a bit about that year. You're only a year old. So, you know, you're, you're funded philanthropically and you have, is it you plus a, a team of volunteers? How, how are you, how are you set up? Um, well, Miguel was working with me. Um, Miguel Escoto worked with me at Earthworks and um, he left Earthworks after actually I was fired at Earthworks and, um, you know, there was 
um, a difference in our theory of change. And so Miguel uh, believed in my theory of change and he left. But I did a lot of work at Earthworks, 13 years. I published many reports. Um, I was on um, a lot of different media, PBS, several different platforms on PBS, BBC, um, all, just all the media, really. Mm. Uh, so, and, and I'm still doing the same work, only we can follow our theory of change. Okay, so t- tell me your theory of change then. Let's let's hear it. Um, I'm not, you know, I am not opposed to regulations. We need regulations, but incremental change is not following the the data, the scientific data. We are past the point of incremental change, and the UN says that. The International Energy Agency says that we have to move very quickly to transition away from oil and gas. So I've always supported anything to do with regulations, but regulations will not save us at this point. We have to stop expanding oil and gas. It's expanding like a contagion. When we travel out to West Texas, everything you can see, they are raising off every bit of ground, bulldozers everywhere, backhoes, they're drilling these giant impoundment pits where they put fresh water for fracking. And they're just, it's everywhere. Drilling rigs everywhere. They are expanding like mad. And that is, you know, not at all the direction we need to be going in. And so um, I'm critical of the current administration. Um, You know, I know that the, other choice is not viable, but if you're not, if you don't critique someone who is in power, then there's not much chance that you're going to be able to change the situation. And Joe Biden has the power to turn this around. He could declare a national climate emergency and use his executive powers to reinstate the crude oil export ban the largest greenhouse emitter in the world is in Texas, in the Permian Basin. The only reason that the Permian Basin is booming is because in 2015, Congress overturned a decades-old crude oil export ban. (laughs) So now they can export that light, sweet crude that we can't refine. They can export that. They can export the gas. And so if the crude oil export ban were reinstated, that would really slow down the Permian Basin. We should ban LNG exports and, you know, think very carefully about how we help other countries that need the gas because we don't want them to get the gas from Russia we need to think very carefully about helping them with alternatives, move forward with our alternatives. It takes a very long time to build these export terminals. And then once they're built, they're going to operate for 30 years or more. So Mm -hmm. we are locking ourselves into decades of more oil and gas. And that's not survivable in our current situation. So can I, uh, so I want to come back a little bit to to what you do in your charity, but I also want to dig in on this question because um, the, the, the big challenge is if we're going to get off fossil fuels, we know we're going to have to replace them and we're going to see demand for oil and gas particularly falling off, right? We're going to have a reduction in overall demand. And then the debate comes Okay, so who's going to be the first barrels not sold, right? Who, who's going to Who's going to leave it in the ground? And I, I think there's a big debate. I mean, my home country is the UK. We've got this same kind of paradox where we're doing really well to clean up our acts, but we're currently also seemingly intent on digging every last drop of oil out of the North Sea. And that seems to send a completely mixed message. So is your point that as a responsible global kind of participant in the in the global economy, the US should be starting to think about who's the first barrels not sold and, and not doing the opposite, which is expanding into this market. 
because I can see the logic of that. But also, I suspect there are some people who would say, well, the US is doing this relatively cleanly compared to some other actors, uh, you know, maybe Russia as an example. So, um, you know, w w yeah, tell me how you feel about this. It's quite okay, paradoxical, well, right? The first fallacy is the US is one of the biggest polluters on the planet. Uh, the Texas Permian Basin is the number one geographical area, greenhouse gas, biggest polluter on the planet. I think we, uh, the Permian Basin is 216 gigatons, or is it, anyway, it's 216, I believe, gigatons. And the next geographical location is uh, Russia, and it's number two. It's 166 gigatons. That's quite, that's a big bad actor. The number three geographical location is the Marcellus Shell on the East Coast. And then there's, there's the number four or five or six somewhere in there is New Mexico, the New Mexico Permian Basin. And then you have the Haynesville Shale. All of those areas, those geographical areas are in the top 10 of the biggest polluters on the earth. So Texas, uh, the United States is very far from uh, one of the relatively cleanest producers. And I've been to the UK um, I've seen how they produce oil and gas. Um, and, you know, it's about the same, but not as much. There's not as much. And in some, in some cases, it is a little better, mm. but it's still pretty bad. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that's difficult is that throughout the world, there are different environmental standards, right? I mean, you could, even just comparing Texas and California, there's a very different kind of approach to regulation. And so the standards do differ. But I suppose your point is when you're extracting oil and gas in this way, it's just inherently difficult, it's inherently polluting. And the idea that the US is somehow better than everyone else perhaps is oversold. That's your concern. Way, way oversold. It is way oversold. And part of the US is Texas. And Texas is very belligerent about uh, reining in oil and gas. And so there's the regulation is almost non-existent. Instead of regulating their protectors, their industry protectors, their lap dogs, not watchdogs. And, but, you know, the number three place on the earth is the Marcellus shell in Pennsylvania and Ohio. So, mm. So, that, so will that now? Because we're talking the very week that uh, we've just seen this big kind of uh, fanfare around a new satellite being launched, um, uh, a civil society funded satellite, which makes it quite interesting. Um, and I used to work at Environmental Defence Fund, so I was there when they were starting to think about this project many years ago. Um, but will that will that satellite help tell that story that you're just t telling me now? I don't know. We have we already have about 20 satellites flying over areas detecting methane. Um, some of them are able to uh, detect at the granular level and tell us who is emitting the methane. Um, we have towers, we have flyovers, we have people like me, boots on the ground, everybody showing here is there's a lot of methane and industry saying, oh, we don't know where it's coming from. We need more monitoring. We need more monitoring. And see, now they're not delay. They're not trying to deny anymore. They're just trying to delay and monitoring fits in with their strategy of delay. So we've, we've already got all the information we need. Now they're putting up you know, this new satellite, well, yay. I feel like everybody all week is on a sugar high. They've had too much candy. I want to say, okay, yay, there's now yet another satellite. We've all this money that could have been spent stopping, doing something to stop and enforce, pushing that, 
pushing that direction has been spent on yet another way to monitor it. And Mm -hmm. everybody has had way too much candy all this week. And I think it is affecting (laughs) their thinking, you know, because I just keep saying, okay, now what? What is going to be different? Because we've been showing you methane all these different ways for, I've been doing it for 10 years, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed except the levels of methane in our atmosphere climb higher. Mm, that's a that is a very very good point, and I can remember having this debate with within Environmental Defence Fund actually when it when this idea was first being discussed, and it and it's certainly true that there are already satellites that ha- have been used and are being used to identify leaks. Um, but I guess there's one that I, what happened was though when civil society announced they were going to do this, suddenly the oil and gas companies answered the phone a lot more readily than perhaps they would have done, and it was almost. Uh, a kind of wake up call that this was not going to stay unseen and unheard and, and unnoticed and that, that that the very act that everyone kind of is now scrutinizing this with with a, the technology has come down in cost to such an extent that even civil society can do it I, it acted as a bit of a wake up call but but your point is we've been sending wake up calls for decades and they they've not been heeded so nothing has happened and the only the only difference that I see that this could make is if it is blasted far and wide everywhere enough to get the public's attention, which is something I've been trying to do for 10 years. And um, because the regulatory agencies are not going to do it, they're underfunded, they are conflicted, many of them are corrupt, you know, so they're not going to do it. Our government is not going to do it. For the same reasons, they actually get legal bribe money from the oil and gas industry. So it's going to have to come from a huge push from the public. And as our world heats up, it's like, you know, the sand in the hourglass is running out. And will enough people rise up and push whoever is in the White House to do something, yeah. will that happen before the sand runs out of the hourglass? So I'm, it's funny because I'm now living in the U.S. and so I, I'm following the politics here as I was following it in the U.K. and it's never never a dull moment. But I, I do think perhaps appealing to the White House is, is one route, but actually it probably needs a supranational uh, fix, right? Because this is truly a global issue and uh, there are there are examples of, of regulations at a global level uh, where we've regulated ozone depleting chemicals, right? And we did that at global level. It feels to me like, I, I mean, Europe actually has, I think, said this. They're going to try and start policing their borders more effectively so that they can penalize imports that have got high greenhouse gas uh, attributes. So in a way... It, you know, one way out is that uh, this we find the region that's got the tightest rules, which is probably Europe, and then we build from there and try and get a much more international response so that the White House isn't the only place we can go knocking on the door of. I keep hoping that there will be an international push and pressure on the United States because, and every time a foreign journalist calls I try to do my best to go meet them and take them around and show them what's happening because I want that outside pressure on the United States because we have, we live in so much privilege over here and people keep saying, well, what about China? How many people does China have compared to us? And they're not even number one, two or three on the worst greenhouse gas polluters. So I don't know who's number four, but I think it's Russia again. But um, that's in terms of geographically concentrated. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I I think it's, yeah, anyway, we can talk about the total volume. It's per per capita, your point is that, yeah. Right, it's per capita. I mean, China has a lot of people over there. So, yeah, they're going to have a lot of pollution. But they are moving forward with renewable energy faster than we are. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because you know your home state is Texas, 
it's a it's a strange state in the sense that it's not really connected to the rest of the grid. Um, I'm actually going out there in, in a couple of weeks, so I'm looking forward to visiting for the first time. But the the you know it has got wind power and solar power, and you know, it, but but it's uh, it's still predominantly an, an, a petro state in your view. The the problem so far, I mean, there's there's this huge explosion in renewable energy, and it, they're just building it out everywhere. Um, the problem is it's not displacing oil and gas. The demand for energy is growing, so um, oil and gas just keeps growing. The highest uh, amount of oil produced under Trump was 4.9 million barrels a day, Mm -hmm. 4.9 million barrels a day. And under Biden, we're at 6 million barrels per day. So, yeah. and it, I think it's it's going to be really interesting because, as as we discussed, uh, somebody somewhere is having their oil production displaced, right? Because if demand flattens for the product, which it's likely to, as we electrify transport and and find more efficient ways of uh, moving around, um, somebody's going to be displaced. And it, it, if it's not, it, it might be that it's the poorer nations who can't protect themselves or who can't you know, shore up their oil and gas sector. So we, the richer countries, carry on being even richer because we're continuing to produce, whereas countries who might want to try and follow us up that ladder are unlikely to be able to because demand's going to stop falling. So it seems very seems kind of a, an injustice that uh, we both caused the problem and we continue to cause the problem and people who, who haven't had the uh, benefit of decades of oil and gas riches are not even going to be able to get on the ladder. But they can have the same level of lifestyle with renewable ener- with renewable energy. I mean, really, our our lifestyle is pretty obscene when you think about other countries. One thing that I love about about Europe, you can go in the store for a package of gum, and there might be five or six choices of gum. Here, there's an, an entire aisle. And you could never, you, I get so overstimulated wondering which kind of gum or which kind of toothpaste or which kind of shampoo. We don't need, you know, a whole aisle with just gum on it. I want I want to be like Europe. I mean, there's some really good candy over there, but it's not, you know, this ridiculous yeah. Out well, I say there's the question of choice, which clearly yes, the, the but but there's also the question of volume of consumption, right? Which, uh, you know, definitely everything in the U.S. is slightly bigger and uh, sli- you know, it, it just is the per capita emissions here are way higher, distances are longer, every, everything's a bit more extreme. But but you're right, we we've we've got a very privileged environment. We've become wealthy off the back of fossil fuels. But, I, you know, we're, we're, I mean, as a continent, the U.S. is not immune to the impacts of climate change either, right? So, so this thing is a short-term gain, but probably long-term, a lot of pain. I mean, continental weather patterns are going to shift faster than many other parts of the world. So, you know, and you're going to, we're seeing it already, right? Oh, the, the summers are unbearable here, unbearable. And my dog is going to have to wear shoes because... Oh. Last year, lots of dogs had third degree burns on their feet from walking on the pavement. And that's where I have to walk her. So she's going to have to wear shoes and she's not going to like that. But, you know, just when you look at oil and gas, they have been creating impacts locally everywhere you go. I suffered impacts. I lost, you know, my beloved area, my farm that I lived on. I felt like I could not stay there anymore. And, it, you know, that was my dream. I didn't want it, my son to end up with leukemia because of my dream. I had felt like I had to get him out of there. But so many people have ended up so much worse off. And people every day are suffering just horribly from these impacts, from living downwind of oil and gas. Mm. And, um, and, and you're point is really that now we can do it differently right it used to be the case i think you know there's a lot of oil and gas messaging that says you know you can't live without us we are essential to modern society but but it's increasingly not true right that we know we can make electricity in lots of ways we know that we can be more efficient we can know we can electrify 
So that argument, uh, I guess, is getting less and less um, persuasive to, to, to us, people like us. But, uh, but I don't think the message has got out. And I guess bringing it back to what you do, really what your charity is doing is trying to visualize and make real for people this, this a particular aspect of what they do, which is this pollution, which is otherwise invisible, right? I'm, I'm trying to show people I've been doing this for 10 years, but I've been you know, learning about oil and gas and living with it since 1996. They started promising in early 2000s when we were saying in the Barnett Shell, oh my God, this is terrible. You're making people sick. We're breathing this stuff. They started telling us, don't worry about the emissions. We can fix that. We're all going to make a lot of money. So don't worry about the emissions. So I've been hearing that now for over 20 years. And it's only gotten worse. So I have, I have come to the point where I've learned enough about all the processes and everything to know that the problem is a physics problem. And the industry has not figured out how to defeat physics. And some of them don't really care. You know, some, some try to fix the problem and some don't care. But now we're to a point where the weather is so severe that in the summertime, it gets so hot that they have to release gas because the gas gets so volatile. They have to release it. The engines that they use to move the gas through the pipelines and other things on the sites, the engines are overheating. When that happens, the gas, the wells are still producing gas. It's still coming up. It's still going into a pipeline but there's nowhere for it to go. And it all overpressurizes. They have millions of tons of gas they've had to release this last summer because it was so hot. In the winter, things freeze up. The gas can't get where it needs to go. And, you know, people think it freezes up at the power plants. The gas can't get to the power plants. The gas mm -hmm. is frozen up upstream. So it can't get there. So it's all blasting out into the air. So the industry has created the extreme weather that it can't really survive. Mm, that's such a good point. I mean, and this is what makes climate such a wicked problem because, you know, it, we're in the midst of it now and it makes everything harder now that now that the extremes are with us. Um, you know, just looking, I was looking yesterday at some data around hydro production globally. It's hugely down because we've got droughts. So that hydro power that we used to rely on becomes less reliable. Everything gets harder. And, um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's such a sobering thought there that, uh, that this is, this is another feedback mechanism that we haven't got in our models, uh, in terms of how it gets harder. Sharon, I want to end on a more optimistic note. So I I would love to hear like a little bit like you're about to go out into the field. Tell me a bit about your field visit and like what what your hope is like in the near term and maybe in the long term. Like what what's uh, what's giving you hope and motivation at the moment? Uh, we have a campaign that well we actually have helped a small group of opposition a small opposition group form in the Texas Permian Basin. It's the first one ever. And so they are getting ready to roll out their first campaign, which is about air pollution. So in 2019, the Texas Regulatory Agency, TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, determined that the volatile organic compounds in Midland, Odessa are higher than all of D Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston combined. Now, this is a tiny area, 300,000 people in Midland, Odessa. I don't know how many, probably 10 million in DFW and Houston combined. And they have more volatile, those people are being exposed to very intense levels of benzene and other carcinogens and neurotoxins. So we're about to roll out a campaign around that to help people understand this is about it's this is not even about oil and gas. This is about your homes, your safety, where your children grow and play and learn. And, you know, everybody's being impacted by this. So we're excited about that campaign. Mm -hmm. When we go out in the field, we will have several people with us. We're meeting another group from uh, from Europe 
and they're going to uh, go out in the field and with us and see what's happening. Uh, Italians, so they're trying to fight a new LNG terminal there. And um, we're going to meet with a couple of different um, media outlets, and we are going to wear uh, all of this wastewater. So for every barrel of oil that's produced in the Permian, there's about six barrels of wastewater. And we're going where all this wastewater that's been injected, the earth is vomiting it back up. <laughs> and there's my dog. And um, it's, you know, it's overpressurized everything and the, the well bores are failing and it's contaminating water. There's a 70 acre lake of this toxic water. So we're going to go see that and do some social media around that and mm -hmm. more optical gas imaging, bringing, you know, visualizing the, all the air pollution Mm, yeah. Well, you're, you're going back to your original roots then, aren't you? Of like, this is a local problem and a global problem and you can help highlight it with new technologies, right? Which are now affordable to be in the hands of activists like yourself to really bring bring a spotlight onto the problem. Right. Sharon, it's been a pleasure discussing this all with you and um, I wish you best of luck in your campaigns and your field trip. And um, let's hope like, you know, I'm kind of hoping, yes, I agree with you. The satellite news is all a little perhaps overhyped, but it does signal to me that people uh, are, are applying, you know, lots and lots of people are applying lots of different tools to this problem. And if, you know, if we all come together, um, ultimately the, the lie that um, oil and gas is necessary and that it's somehow clean, you know, we can put that to bed a little bit. Well, thank you for having me. And I hope that, I hope that something works at some time. Yeah. And we don't just keep monitoring. At some point, we stop the methane. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, yes. Well, the pressure's building literally and figuratively. So I'm sure there'll be an inevitable policy response at some point. Thank you so much, Sharon, and uh, best of yeah. luck. Thank you. So that was Sebastian Biro from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and Sharon Wilson from Oilfield Watch. As Sebastian said, when it comes to reducing concentrations of greenhouse gases, we need to be both running a sprint to reduce the very high impact of methane in the short term and a marathon to address the bigger longer term problem of carbon dioxide. And we can't trade one off against the other. Both races need to be won to reduce climate risks. And to do that, we need the right investment incentives, which will likely be a combination of both carrots and sticks. Sebastian and Sharon have different theories of change and very different levels of trust in the oil and gas sector. But what unites them and the team behind MethaneSat is a belief that greater visibility and transparency will be a forcing factor for positive change. I sincerely hope they're right. As usual, we'll add any relevant additional information in the show notes, including a link to the episode with Jason Anderson of Climate Works Foundation, where we discussed climate super pollutants. Thank you to the cleaning up team for their support in producing this episode, in particular producer Zach Sabon and researcher Eliza Tucson. And thanks to you for listening. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, as well as by the Liebreich Foundation, the Gilardini Foundation, and our newest supporter, Ecopragma Capital.